Hello everyone and welcome to this month's doctoral seminar featuring Jennifer Nye. Jennifer Nye is a full-time doctoral student and research assistant at Kent State University where she's studying curriculum and instruction literacy. Prior to her doctoral studies, Jennifer was an elementary teacher and reading specialist and her research interests include writing, multiple literacies, teacher education, and the use of literacy for transformative purposes. This is the first time Jennifer is presenting at our doctoral web seminar. We look forward to hearing her insights on the mixed methods paradigm. My name is Tubanga Crowder and I'm one of the moderators tonight. I would like to introduce Dr. Peggy Albers, Professor of Language and Literacy Education in the College of Education at Georgia State University. She is the founder of Global Conversations in Doctoral Preparation as well as Global Conversations in Literacy Research. Global Conversations in Doctoral Preparation is a mentoring web seminars that are designed by doctoral students for doctoral students. These webinars offer different perspectives on various topics related to doctoral educational experience. We are very excited to have doctoral students like Jennifer from Kent State University. We welcome doctoral students from across the country as well as internationally to present at these web seminars. We hope that these seminars will be extended into global conversations around doctoral preparation so that we can learn from and within each other. These doctoral web seminars cover a range of topics. They can be about research we are engaging, some aspects of the doctoral program, or about how to mentor ourselves into the academy. Tonight's presentation by Jennifer, Meeting in the Middle, the Mixed Methods Paradigm is one such mentoring session that will guide us in our academic research and writing. We are using Blackboard Collaborate and I, you will become familiar with the tools. Feel free to ask Jennifer questions by typing in the chat box. We will be collecting questions as we proceed with the seminar. There will be a question and answer session at the end of her presentation. We would love to know from which part of the world you are joining us tonight. You will see a toolbar on your left where you can click on the star. Please drag it and place it on the map or if you like you can type in the chat box. So it seems we are all from the United States, maybe. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jennifer. Jennifer Nye is a full-time doctoral student and research assistant at Kent State University, where she's studying curriculum and instruction literacy. Her research interests include writing, multiple literacies, teacher education and the use of literacy for transformative purposes. She is currently the manager of professional development for the educational resource company, Learning A to Z. Prior to this role, Jennifer taught various elementary grade levels in both brick and mortar and virtual schools. Jennifer has also spent time instructing graduate students at the post-secondary level and is currently a doctoral student at Kent State University, earning a PhD in Curriculum and Instruction Literacy. In her role as a doctoral candidate, Jennifer's line of inquiry consists of writing, teacher education, and the use of literacy for transformative purposes. She has also presented at numerous state, national, and international conferences, and has published in peer-reviewed academic journals. Jennifer is also a wife and a mother to three young, active children. A couple of examples from Jennifer's recent publications are Pre-Service Teachers' Perceptions of 21st Century Writing Instruction. This is going to be published in Teaching and Writing, 
the Journal of Writing Teacher Education. Another article has been published in this year, Motivating MOOCs, a quantitative case study of high school students and sustained interest in MOOCs, it's Journal of Online Learning Research. In this presentation, Jennifer will provide information regarding polarizing worldviews and diverse experiences on mixed method research. She will then argue for mixed methods as an option for designing research that is not only rigorous and trustworthy, but also capitalizes on the strengths and weaknesses of qualitative and quantitative research. She will further show how mixed methods research can be a viable option for team-oriented research that is cross-disciplinary. Through this presentation, Jennifer will guide the participants to foundational understanding of what we believe should be considered the third research paradigm, mixed methods. It's great pleasure that I welcome Jennifer Nine on behalf of Global Conversations in Doctoral Preparation. Jennifer, you are on. Thank you very much, Sula. I really appreciate the wonderful introduction. And I wanted to take a minute to also thank Dr. Albers and the other wonderful members and the Global Conversations in Doctoral Preparation for providing this opportunity for doctoral students like me. I love that I saw that you are all in Georgia. I'm very jealous of that. I am up here in Ohio, and we are still down in the 30s. It is still cold. Uh, we had my son's baseball game tonight, and we were sitting there with coats and hats and gloves, still freezing. So uh, I hope you get down and see y'all in Georgia sometime. <laughs> All right, well, let me go ahead and I want to give a little bit of front loading to this presentation. And to give you a little bit about front loading, I need to tell you a little bit about myself. I come to my doctoral studies as a first grade teacher. That's where I spend the most of my time. I'm also a mom to three young kids, so I have been encompassed in childhood for quite a long time now. When I came into my doctoral studies, my background was not only in teaching, but also in being a literacy specialist, which is very, very practitioner-based. So when I came into my PhD program, one of my first questions asked me by my advisor was, well, what are you, qual or quan? And, you know, at that time, I was like, I don't know what I am. And so I learned a little bit more and realized I am totally qualitative. Uh, I've never been a numbers person. I have never been a um, black and white type of person. I've always kind of seen that gray middle ground. So I felt that I fell very well into that qualitative realm. So as I was moving through my coursework uh, at Kent State, we had to take multiple resource um, courses, just, just like I'm sure you all have too. And my advisor wanted me to take after quantitative research, which I had already taken, it was kind of, I was so excited. He wanted me to also take advanced quantitative. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm done. I did my quantitative stuff. I'm moving forward. He said, you know what? He said, we're going to actually offer an entire course just on mixed methods. He said, I will meet you in the middle. And if you'll take that mixed method, I'll kind of scratch that advanced fall. You don't have to worry about it. I said, you got it. I'm all for it. So I walk into my first meeting of the mixed methods class, and I was used to all of my literacy colleagues. And we are all pretty familiar, though we had different lines of inquiry, we were pretty familiar in the ways we think. And within this class were colleagues that thought very, very different from me. And throughout this course, what resonated most with me is that I, through a mixed method paradigm, can collaborate with these individuals who maybe come out their research and their lines of inquiry through very different lenses. 
but that together with this paradigm, we can collaborate and do some cross-disciplinary research. So that is kind of what led me to really diving into mixed methods. Um, I had hoped my dissertation would be mixed methods. However, my research questions did not lead me toward that path. But I do see such value in this paradigm, and I see such value in being able to use it to really make those connections with colleagues that might have different lenses on what they do. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a background information on where this presentation came from. Um, I know that Ryan here in our audience today that he is actually using mixed methods in his dissertation. So I encourage any of you to please make this a collaborative session. We're a very small group. Interrupt me if needed. Put your questions in the chat box. And provide your insight also, because I am a very novice researcher, just like most of us doctoral students are, so that we can continue to learn from each other in, even in these types of environments. Meeting in the middle, mixed method. So I want everybody for just a moment, I want you to take a look at this picture. And in the chat box, if you can write for me, what do you see is the issue here? Or what might be a problem? Okay, too much attention, okay? Attention might be a problem, absolutely. What else you might see based on this cover, and this comes from just an informational newspaper for adolescents. But I think from not only the, the photograph, but also the title, Moments to the Rescue. Ah, Dr. Albert says injury. Absolutely. Anything else out there? Okay, concussions, maybe, not understanding each other well. Great. Those are all issues that we might all see when we look at this specific piece of text. And all those could be very, very valid. When I first saw this illustration, the first thing that I thought about was my eight-year-old son. And my eight-year-old son is very much into sports. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, we just came from a, ba a doubleheader baseball game, and we just tried out for the travel soccer team on Saturday. Um, he has played flag football, but he's not a big guy. My husband is only a couple inches taller than me, and I'm not very tall. So my son is not a very big kid. So I've always, as a mom, been a little bit hesitant about going the football route. It's pretty big where we live. And I'm just not there with my mentality that to have my kid kind of, you know, doing all the football stuff. So when I saw this, I immediately thought of my son kind of in that setting and possibly, as Ryan said, concussions or injuries. And from that helmet, it does the same. From those illustrations, it's the same thing. It looks as if perhaps they're going to discuss how helmets can help prevent injury or specifically concussion. So now, based on what you saw as an issue, a possible issue from this illustration, what might be a real general research question that you would ask in order to investigate that issue? And while you're thinking of a very general research question, I promise you I'm not looking at the validity of those questions. <laughs> um, I want you to create a research question that is based on the lens you typically view your research through. Okay? And to give you an example, since I view things very much through, through a qualitative type of lens, I might perhaps want to ask, how does the helmet feel? when they use different ones, or perhaps how, what are their perceptions of using different types of helmets? What might you ask based on the issue you see at hand? Okay. 
And as you can tell through my presentations, I like to ask a lot of questions and get audience participation. I can never take off that first grade teaching hat. <laughs> Okay, so Dr. Alvaro says, to what extent are hand injuries in football reported by coaches in high school? Great question. Fantastic. Okay, and it looks like Ryan is typing, so I'll give you all a few more moments. Okay, Ryan says, what are football player perceptions of existing helmets and new technology? Excellent question again. So, to sum up, this little introduction. We're viewing an issue, and that's what we do as researchers. From that issue, we ask research questions. Those research questions can be very, very different based on how we view the world, what our background is, what our knowledge is, and what we want to know. As has been kind of alluded to in the questions, oh, uh, Tuba just said, how do you define the winner in this situation? Awesome question and very different from the other one. Tuba wasn't looking at that issue from a injury point of view as I was. But she wanted to know how do you define the winner in this situation. And that's a very, very subjective question. That's a very much an interview type of question. So as was alluded to by you all's wonderful on-the-spot research questions, you can see from this table is that there are ways we would investigate that most commonly through a qualitative lens or a quantitative. So perhaps we're going to interview the experts about their perceptions on the issue and pollution. Okay? We might observe what's happening. We might review some unobtrusive pieces of data. On the quantitative end, we might create a tool for measurement. Or we might conduct a quasi or experimental type of study on different types of helmets. We might also do some type of survey. Um, yes, you would say we might take pictures. Absolutely. All of those methods and all of those ways will help us answer our question. But they're very distinctly in two different camps. However, we can certainly also view different issues. Oh, Brian, how did you know? <laughs> Let's combine the methods. <laughs> Let's put those qualitative methods and the quantitative together to form that mixed method paradigm. And it's really interesting because as we were going through this course, of course, we looked at the history of mixed methods, and mixed methods has a much more stronger foundation than it did in years past. But compared to quantitative specifically, and then moving to the qualitative, it, it's relatively new. It doesn't have quite as strong of a foundation. There's still some issues that different um, camps are arguing and trying to work out. But it has certainly become much more established. And I think as more and more are doing this, and more quality research is getting put out that is underneath this paradigm, we're seeing how valid and reliable and trustworthy and whatever types of those vocabulary words you want to use are within this paradigm. And as Ryan just said in the chat box, by doing this, you get more info and a more well-rounded answer than just one or the other answer. And that is certainly a benefit of this mixed method paradigm. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more in depth about what mixed methods research is. So during my course, one of the books that we used the most was this one right here. And hopefully you can see it on my webcam. Um, I would be very safe to say that at Kent State, we do a lot with Cresswell. So he is certainly uh, cited in many of our papers. <laughs> yes, Tuba, you also. Um, I had a feeling it was probably pretty similar at other universities also. Um, so a lot of the information that I pulled together for this presentation came actually from that book that I just showed you. I would completely recommend it. It is a great introduction to this methodology. 
So, so what is mixed method research? research? According, According to Cresswell, it is an approach to research in the social, behavioral, and health sciences in which the investigator gathers both quantitative or closed-end and qualitative open-end data, integrates the two, and then draws interpretations based on the combined strengths of both sets of data to understand research problems. Now, now I want you to take a minute, I want you to just read that definition again. And in the chat box, I want you to put one word that really stood out to you in that definition. That kind of just hit you and made you think about that mixed methods paradigm. Okay, integrate. Yes. Cuba says combined strengths. Yes. yes. Interpretation. Great. Dr. Albers and Caleb are right around on the same page there. Those are all words that stuck out to me also. And I think the word that sticks out to me is combined. And we look at that mixed method as a very fine dance between the qualitative and quantitative paradigm that we so commonly are engaged in. So, where do I begin with mixed methods? Well, as all researchers, we know that we start with the research question. And my fellow doctoral students, give me a smiley face. If you have heard that over and over again throughout all of your studies, no matter where you are in that process, um, I'm going to give you a smiley face there. there. Okay. An awesome. Uh, Dr. Dr. Albert said, the reason I didn't choose combine is because we do this in fall research as well. Combining different methods to collect different data types of data dependent on the research questions. Absolutely. That's a great interpretation of that word uh, to also describe qualitative research. Excellent. Okay, so back to Cresswell in another text that he has some information about mixed methods is he provides some general, very general questions as to what type of research questions we would ask with the mixed methods paradigm. So, for example, to what extent do the quantitative and qualitative results converge? So how, if I'm doing both a quantitative aspect of a study and a qualitative, how do those come together to help make sense of the other? We can also ask, in what ways do the quantitative data help to explain the qualitative? So perhaps the quantitative is a little bit more profound in a given study or based on a research question. But we want to use that qualitative to validate what we're learning in the quantitative stage. We can also flip that in the fact that we can have it more heavy on qualitative. And we can then use our quantitative findings to enhance what we found during the qualitative study. All right, now this is the part. Once we know we have our research question, and once we know that our research question firmly supports the mixed methods paradigm, theory has always been that aspect that I have found very, very intriguing, but also a bit challenging. I always felt that no matter if I was doing quantitative or qualitative research, that I felt that I needed to almost fit myself in a box. And I had a really hard time with that because I knew that I wasn't necessarily this and I wasn't necessarily this. And sometimes it changed. But we know that theory is really the cornerstone or the foundation of our research. But how does that look in a mixed method study? On one end, if you're more heavily related to the quantitative type of research, you might look at things a little bit differently. And how you look at things might co may not coexist very well with how you would look at them in your qualitative. So you can sometimes have that 
a little bit of a struggle, some tension there. So when I was trying to learn about that a little more, and you had a lot of class discussions on that, but what we kind of came to the consensus was is that mixed methods is a way for us to embrace multiple traditions. And we can take it that route, or we can also use something that's a little bit more unified. And they also suggest perhaps pragmatism, if they look at things a little bit more in a pragmatic type of format. However, the most distinctive part of that is that, as always, we have to make our theories explicit. And we have to identify the key thought orders of those theories and suggest and really possibly argue for how that theory is going to support that particular mixed methods study. And Ryan, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but since you have really been diving into your dissertation in a mixed methods format, how have you tackled the theory with that? Can you provide any insight to that? And I don't know if we have access to our microphone or if you want to just type it in the chat box, but I find this to be a really interesting part of this paradigm because it could be so challenging um, to really make it make sense. And this was another part where I see Ryan typing. Um, this is another part that when we were going through the course and we were having conversations with colleagues from all different departments, not necessarily just from curriculum and instruction as I am, we really challenge each other as to how we can take our very different lenses and the different theories that we typically go to and how we can integrate them into this paradigm. Oh, I'm sorry, Ryan. I was just curious as to how, through your dissertation and using the mixed methods paradigm, how you kind of tackled um, theory and integrated that into your uh, study. If you found that to even be challenging or, you know, contradictory, especially if you lean more towards qualitative versus quantitative. And if not, that's no comment. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just know that you're kind of a resident expert here in this session. So, <laughs> thank you. All right. So, we will go ahead and continue to move forward and talk about very challenging, still working on it. Okay, good, good, good. So, that is certainly along the same lines as I felt about that, too, that it was a certainly a hurdle that we needed to do or to kind of talk about. So once we know our issue, once we have our research question, and we know that our research question supports the use of mixed methods, and we've also tackled the theory aspect, we need to then design our study. And the mixed method has a whole range of different designs that you can implement within that paradigm. What's really interesting is some of them are extremely advanced. And that book that I showed you had just these laid out steps and, and they were very integrated and they were very integrated at different points. And we're not going to get into those tonight. Um, but I did list a couple of them that I thought were really interesting and worth investigating when perhaps I'm a little bit more of a, not so much a novice researcher. Um, yeah, yeah, these advanced methods, too, are really interesting. So, for example, the intervention design, we have that. Social justice design, I'm really interested in looking at things through a critical lens, but also really using literacy for transformative purposes. And the social justice design was, again, very, very integrate. It very, very, it had a lot of stuff. Um, but it was, it could be pretty amazing, it seemed. Um, there was also something, a multi-stage evaluation design, and it was very, very laid out, very, very time-consuming, uh, certainly not a 
study that I would probably feel comfortable at my level taking on at this time. I think that as doctoral students to kind of get a little bit better of a foundation before diving into something that was as detailed as that was. But the three main and most Common types of designs are the convergence, the explanatory, and the exploratory. So we're going to talk about each of those for just a minute. The convergent design is when you take the quantitative and the qualitative and you do them simultaneously and you merge the findings and the interpretation at that stage. So up until your interpretation and your analysis, everything is separate and it merges at that final stage. Now thinking about that, doing qualitative and quantitative studies essentially at the same time and then bringing them together, I almost view it as like a funnel. What do you think are some challenges to that? Or perhaps what do you think are some advantages to that? Yes, and Ryan, you're using a little bit more of a, you know, a higher level type of mixed methods design, so you're doing qual, 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 which is a convergent parallel he mentioned, and it's concurrent as well. Yes. Okay, awesome. She was going to ask the same question. Great. Well, what do you think about the convergent design? What do you think some advantages and disadvantages to that would be? Remember, you're doing essentially two different parts of the study, both qualitative and quantitative, and you're not putting them, you're not integrating them until the end when you're making your interpretation. What do you think some of the challenges or benefits or the affordances and tensions of that design would be? Okay, I see some typing, so I'm giving you a second here. <clears throat> ah, the convergent design. Researcher preference. That's a great one. Yes, researcher preference. That is one that I would have thought too. That seems logical. I think the tension is looking at data from two different perspectives, two different lenses that are quite distant from each other. I wonder if it is the explanation of the data rather than the method by which the data is collected. That's a great question. And I even thought with that conversion design, just on a real basic level, the time commitment to that and the ability to really analyze and to not be biased to one or the other. However, if you have two parallel data sets and two parallel uh, forms of data, to be able to integrate that and have them inform the interpretation can be a real strength of that. So the other two that are just opposite of each other, is explanatory sequential and exploratory sequential. So explanatory is using quant to qual, and the qual is basically explaining the quant. So let me say that again. Explanatory is using the quant to explain, and then the qual, so you do quant, then qual, and that qual is basically explaining, further explaining your quant finding. And it's going sequential. It's much more linear than that conversion design. Opposite is the exploratory, where the exploratory starts with the qualitative part of your study, and it moves then to the quant. And again, the quant is used to help further explain that first stage, that qualitative stage, okay? So they're both linear. They just, one explanatory starts with qual, no, I'm sorry, explanatory starts with quant, and exploratory starts with qual, 
Okay, so let me stop there for a second, and let me see a couple questions in there. Can two researchers working separately and then coming together take care of some of the disadvantage of conversion design? That's a fabulous question, and absolutely. That is actually, I think, one of the benefits of using mixed methods in general, is that it's a great way, again, if your research questions support it, for multiple researchers to come together with their own biases, their own lenses, their own views of things, and be able to use that type of design. And that is where I saw the cross-disciplinary. So perhaps if I wanted to do some literacy research in the content area of mathematics, and perhaps a colleague of mine views their research through a very different lens, we can then work on those phases together and converge at the end to be able to make our interpretation. Okay, so great, great question. Any other questions about these three basic designs? Keep in mind that that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more designs, and I think they're ever evolving also. I'm sure that a year from now, uh, removed from the class, there might even be more that have been coming about or are being discussed. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting, too. That's, that's what drew me to the entire paradigm here, was the fact of being able to work with others that see things in a very different way than I do. All right, let's go ahead and move on. So how will I collect my data, or what data will I collect, and how will I analyze it? So I found this little comic that I thought was cute. Um, the way I feel is hard to quantify. <laughs> How about on a scale of 1 to 10? So I kind of thought that that certainly speaks to the polar ends of qualitative and quantitative, which I want to put the disclaimer out there, too, and I should have mentioned this at the very beginning, but, you know, I'm kind of polarizing those two types of research, and we know that they both have their place in all that we do, especially in the social sciences. So I don't want it to make it seem like it's either or because there is value in, to, in both of them. Um, but how will I collect that? Uh, what data will I collect? Again, it depends on your research question. You can collect the same type of data that you would collect in just a wall or font. So perhaps if I am doing an explanatory sequential design and I'm starting with quant, I might want to do a survey. When, when I, I get, get to my qual phase, I might, might then want to do observations or interviews to support what I found in my quantitative phase of the study. So data collection is the same. It does need to be related to your research question and the design of your study. Same thing with the analyzing data. This is where it might get a little bit more tricky because if you're in the convergent type of model where you're not truly making deep interpretations until those are together, but you're certainly still using many of the same types of data analysis tools that you use when you're doing either qual or quant. So if you are typically drawn to quantitative research, and you do a lot of, um, you know, SPSS and those types of tools, you would still be able to use those within mixed methods. Same thing with qualitative. If you typically do a lot of um, constant comparison types of data analysis and using your codes and collapsing into your categories and your themes, all those still come into play. It's just how you then are able to make the interpretation so that one part of the data is able to inform the other and vice versa. Okay? Uh, so Tina says, how possible to reach contradictory or conflicting findings at the end? What would we do then? You know, that's a great question, and I really think that that would be common. Uh, and I would think that and again, I don't have anything to cite this off the top of my head, but I think what you would certainly do is you would want to try to rely on those same types of um, techniques 
that you use when you do any other research. So you want to maybe reach out to a peer to see if your codes, if you're using qualitative, make sense to you. Or reach out to a colleague that can help you make sense a little bit more of your quantitative findings. So you want to just rely on those same tried and true methods that we've always done in research. And if they continue to contradict, then I think that that's telling also. Uh, perhaps if you're qualitative, you've done observations, you've done interviews, and you saw something specific, and then you survey people to see if that coincides with what you observed or interviewed, and there's some confliction there, then that data speaks to something very specific also. Um, it's kind of, I remember learning that no data is, any data is good data. Um, so no matter your findings, you're still learning something from it. And I think that would be the same if, if there's some contradictions there. But I'm sure that with the help of colleagues, we can try to make sense of those contradictions. <clears throat> Okay, so one really interesting thing, and I, I found this to be really kind of fun, um, and only doctoral students can say that this is kind of fun, but when you're doing mixed methods, you have to, well, I don't want to say have to, but it's strongly recommended that you design your study in a, in a diagram format, okay? So I'm actually going to come back to this slide because now as I'm talking, I'm, I'm wishing that I put these other slides before it. So when I say a design or a diagram, what I'm meaning is that it is almost in a picture type of format. Okay? So you can see this right here. This is an example of a diagram that we'll come back to in a minute. This is the most simplistic diagram in mixed methods that is out there, okay? okay. The, the other ones, ones are very, very integrated. This is very, very simplistic. But what a lot of mixed methods like to see, and if you're proposing a study, they want to see a diagram. And I have seen, too, in some research that we kind of evaluated as we were learning about mixed methods, is that some journals, whether they requested it or whether there was just space allowed for it, promoted and had that diagram actually within the study. So, thinking about a diagram such as this, here are some of what the diagrams look like. Now, notice that for the first and second bullet point, and let me get my pointer out here, I should have been using that. So for my first bullet point and my second bullet point, qual and quan. Quan is in uppercase. Or it can be in lowercase, same as qual. If you see that in a diagram, what that's showing is that, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, one second, someone's coming to my door. The joys of having a family at home on a Sunday evening during a presentation. <laughs> um, so when you see the uppercase, it means that the emphasis is putting it on that, that type of research, okay? So if you see QUAN capitalized, it means the emphasis on that study is on QUAN or QUAL, depending on the upper or lower case. So it's just a way to signify that. Yes, Dr. Alvarez, I have a very, very old dog that usually doesn't get off the couch. Uh, until someone comes to the door in the middle of a presentation. <laughs> okay, so we also have that you'll see is very common in the diagrams is a plus sign. And it simply means the same as we know any addition sign means, and it's adding the quant to the qual together. Okay? Right arrow is just the progression of the diagram, the progression of the study. You also will see boxes and circles at different times to denote just different aspects within that diagram. And you'll see in the next one how I put um, squares around the part of the study that's occurring. 
they recommend that when you are diagramming, that you diagram both data collection, data analysis, and interpretation. So those are the three main things that you would see in a mixed method diagram. So let's look at a couple of those, as I mentioned before. Here's the exploratory design that we just talked about. The exploratory design starts with the qualitative part of the study. It then moves to the quantitative study, part of the study, and then it does the interpretation. Notice in this study that qual is capitalized, and that's just denoting that the emphasis is on the qualitative aspect of this design. Again, there's those arrows. It's just simply denoting the linear aspect of this design. Same thing with explanatory. We've got quan to qual to interpretation. Emphasis is on the quan because it is signified with those capital letters. Okay. And the last one is here is this convergent parallel design. Okay, that one that I kind of pictured as a funnel. You did your qual part of the study, your results. At the same time that you're doing your quantitative aspect of the study, the results, and then you're merging them together for the interpretation. This one, just for an example, I put qual as the capital letters, just signifying to myself that it is the emphasis of the study. Again, Again, when you get into those more detailed and higher level types of designs, these diagrams were extremely extensive. They had many, many parts, um, many different phases, many different layers. So it can get very, very, very detailed. Awesome, Ryan. So this is the one that you're doing right here? The convergent parallel? Yes, yes, awesome. awesome. Okay, okay, fantastic. Maybe when we're all done, you can share some of your insights about actually engaging in this. Okay, so now that hopefully we have a little bit of a foundation of what the... Can you switch the quan and the call? Do you mean the emphasis on which one? Yeah, 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 you, you can, can switch, switch those emphasis. emphasis. It would be dependent on your research question and how your study is designed. So qual or quant can be emphasized more. So what are some of the benefits of mixed methods? And we kind of alluded to some of these when I kind of front-loaded the presentation by giving you what made me interested in this paradigm. So what I, one of the benefits is that words and numbers can be used. I'm fully open to the fact that I am not a numbers person. I never have been. Um, I probably never will be. But I value it, and I see how much it can enhance my line of inquiry. So if I can use both words and numbers in some aspects, that's a very big benefit for me. Would I need some support? And being able to do the numbers aspect of it? Absolutely. Ryan alluded to this a little bit earlier in the presentation. Studies can produce stronger evidence. Imagine the strengths and weaknesses of qualitative research. Imagine the strengths and weaknesses of quantitative research. When using this method, those can speak to one another and help to balance those weaknesses and strengths a little bit more evenly. Um, more flexibility for the researcher, okay? There's a lot of flexibility in mixed methods and the fact that there's so many designs and they appear to be continuing to evolve. Balance and strengths and weaknesses, we kind of just said that. This is kind of an important one. Um, Something that qualitative research kind of gets downplayed about is the fact that it's not necessarily generalizability. It's, it's not generalizable. Um, and there's arguments for that. However, if you're using both qualitative and quantitative, 
that is just one aspect of your argument that you can support that, okay, the only study might be more heavily on the qual end of things. Because I'm also using some quantitative research, I can perhaps make a little bit more interpretations in regards to how generalizable it is. And again, this last one that I spoke to, cross-content research opportunities, this is the best part of it. The fact that this opens up so many doors to working with colleagues and different lines of inquiry and different programs, even beyond, I mean education, but beyond education. And being able to do that is so critical because the more that we can make things interdisciplinary, the better things are going to get and the more we're going to understand things, especially from an education point of view. There are some challenges, as with anything we do, it's very time consuming. If you're doing essentially two studies in one, it's going to take more time. It can also be more expensive, depending on the time commitment, depending on if it's perhaps grant funded, you're going to have more money being allocated to possible multiple researchers, so it can be both time consuming and more expensive. Um, it requires both qualitative and quantitative expertise. No matter what I do, I will not have the expertise in quantitative as I do in qualitative. And that's okay because I can either reach out for that support or I just spend a lot more time and I really figure it out. Additional researchers might be needed if research is congruent. So kind of same thing with expensive. Um, you might need to have two researchers if you're doing two studies essentially parallel to one another. And also mixed methods is not as defined as the qualitative and quantitative paradigm. Um, though I do believe that since it has been around a little while, it's starting to shed a little bit of that. And I think as we researchers dabble in it a little bit more and put research out there that is very trustworthy and very uh, valid and you know thorough, then hopefully we can continue to put mixed methods on the same playing ground as qualitative and quantitative. All right, and then we just have some final references. Again, if mixed methods is new to you, I would certainly start with this book. I'm not advertising by any means or way. Um, this just happened to be a really nice, condensed, um, and concise way for a novice researcher to be able to understand this paradigm a little bit more. So thank you so much. I hope that you were able to take one thing at least away from this presentation and that we can continue as new researchers to expand not only our field and our lines of inquiry, but just research in general. So thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for um, helpful responses. And thank you for the questions, everyone. Uh, we would appreciate you taking a moment to type into the chat area one thought about this web seminar. And thank you for participating in this web seminar. If you would like to participate in a 15 minute online interview as part of our GCDP research study, please type your name and email address into the chat box and someone from the research team will contact you within a few days to schedule an interview. Also, we would appreciate uh, if you could take our survey. The link is on the slides. It can also be found on our website. This series of GCDP web seminars is a result of our hard work of a team of doctoral students pictured on the slide who are working together to cre create global conversations among like-minded people. I would like to alert you to the upcoming web seminars for the spring. On May 3rd, we welcome Nicole Pettit and Molly Friesenborg from Georgia State University and the Director of Programs at Girls Incorporation, respectively, who will be speaking on 
an introduction to community, engage research. And on May 17, Kim Foster, Kyle Jones, and Nick Thompson from Kennesaw State University will be presenting on From the Water Cooler to the Fire Hose, Teaching Our Way Through an English at Doctorate. We hope that you will mark these dates on your calendar. Please spread the world through your social networks. We invite you to all present at GCVP. You may consider inviting friends and colleagues from other universities or from different parts of the world to do a joint presentation with you. We have just completed a series of global conversations in literacy research web seminars for 2014 and 15. Please look for updates on the list of speakers for the 2015 and 2016 series. As we wrap up this evening seminar, please take a moment to follow us on Facebook, WordPress, Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. All the links can be found on our WordPress site. We hope you will share this information with your friends and colleagues. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. We appreciate your presence and participation. We look forward to having you next time. Good night.